Microbial nutrition and growth is such a broad topic that we're actually going to bring in a little bit of, of content from the lab this time. So labs five and six are going to have some terminology that are, those terms are going to be fair game for lecture, lecture coverage as well, largely because these are terms that are, I don't want to have to review them again because they're kind of boring. That is, how many times can you say a thermophile is a bacterium that likes hot temperatures? It really is a very straightforward set of lingo. And I want you to be able to retain, however, that straightforward set of terms that, and bring it over into lecture with you so that we can have some much more sexy-minded discussions than just covering those very benign terms. So that being said, let's jump right in to our coverage here in lecture by asking a kind of cool question. And that is, it, why is it important for microorganisms to be able to transport molecules into and out of the cell? Probably already you're thinking, I, I would say, take in nutrients. Maybe you're hungry. I mean, maybe you're in lecture, you know, it's almost lunchtime. You're like, take in nutrients. So this is obviously one thing that's very important. And maybe some of you are the opposite and you're like, man, I wish Rachel would stop talking and this podcast would end so I can go pee. Um, so expel waste, right? So whether we're talking about a, a eukaryotic microorganism or whether we're talking about archaea, bacteria, or our eukaryotes, namely our fungi and proteins, all of them need to expel waste and all of them need to bring in nutrients. But there are some more interesting reasons why a cell might need to get things in and out. For example, communication. Remember talking very briefly in class about um, the process called quorum sensing. Quorum sensing is the process by which cells, bacterial cells at a high enough titer actually talk to one another and cause each other to express certain genes because they're in a high titer, a high concentration. So communication between cells, not only important in the eukaryotic world, but also within the bacterial and archaeal world. And of course, competition likewise. Let's face it, antibiotics are not made for our benefit. They're made for the benefit of the bacteria or fungi that produce them to allow them to compete with things in their environment, maybe to also dictate species composition with a, in a particular niche. So competition is another major thing, so secreting antimicrobials, antibiotics, also, there are some um, compounds called bactericins that are like literally like little bacterial machine guns. They poke holes into competing bacterial membranes. Um, we could also think about just simply, ah, that should say five, um, exporting proteins that do their job outside of the cell. So secreting proteins that work outside. So these are just um, a subset of reasons that an organism might need to transport molecules. We can keep on adding to the list. Actually, maybe I'll add one more. What about this one? Maintaining gradients. That could be a proton motive force, or it could just be another ion gradient that is involved perhaps in transport. I bet you could keep adding to this list, and I'm going to challenge you to do so. I can picture already that probably Claire has about 10 more added onto here um, and is still writing. But I would encourage you to think about other, other ways or other reasons that it's important for cells to be able to transport things in and out. But we're going to stop right now because I want to begin to talk about particular transport systems. And as we talk about the first one, of course, this has already been something that we have mentioned. Uh, that is, we've talked about the fact that the cytoplasmic membrane 
acts sort of like a, a bouncer at a dance club, only, only allowing in those uh, molecules that have tiny molecular weight and are highly hydrophobic. So remember that simple or passive diffusion is just the movement of highly hydrophobic, tiny, tiny molecules like oxygen and carbon dioxide to freely move across the membrane, and they move with response to their gradient. That is, they move from a region of high concentration to a region of low concentration. So if the CO2 outside the cell is higher than it is inside, it will freely move across the membrane until though there's an equilibrium established between those concentrations. If likewise the CO2 inside the cell is greater, it will move out of the cell, diffuse out uh, in response to that concentration gradient. So the um, important note about simple diffusion is that it is passive. So when you see this term passive, recognize that that means that this is non-energy requiring. So passive diffusion means that there is no input of either ATP or proton motor force or any sort of energy source to allow this to happen. It is simply passive. Now, what we might also recognize is that the rate of transport depends linearly on concentration gradient. That is, the greater the concentration gradient, the faster the rate. And this kind of has analogy with our, our bouncer at a dance club kind of analogy as well. Um, obviously, the more uh, low molecular weight women not wanting to drink water that are hanging out outside the club, the faster that bouncer is going to let people into the club um, and the more quickly it's going to get crowded in there and perhaps the tides will turn as people are like, wow, it's way too crowded in here and then they start fluxing out, right, in response to the concentration gradient. <laughs> now, you might be thinking, what about molecules that are, you know, have a gradient where they're higher outside of the cell than in, but they're polar, that is, they're not hydrophobic. Well, they have to have a special transporter. They cannot cross by simple passive diffusion. But they don't need energy, right? Because they have a higher concentration outside than in. So it's still passive diffusion, but they need a transporter. So we call it facilitated passive diffusion because there has to be a channel or carrier involved. That is, there has to be some route by which this polar molecule takes to get in and get past that hydrophobic layer of tails. So the route for that is to go through an integral membrane protein. And as you might picture, the integral membrane protein would have this open uh, area through which the polar molecule would pass. And lining the pore of that um, transporter would be hydrophilic amino acids, right? Things like glutamate and aspartate and lysine and arginine would line the pore so that, that um, water-loving molecules would feel comfortable to pass through that channel or uh, carrier. So it allows a larger, more polar molecule to move passively, that is from a high region of high concentration to a region of low concentration, down its concentration grading, gradient. No energy required, but a channel or carrier is required. Now do note that there is a difference between channels and carriers. Channels are simply like sieves, that is, there's not a lot of um, restriction as to the, the rapidity with which uh, a, cell, uh, a molecule can pass through and into the cell. However, with carriers, carriers are limited. That is, they can only accommodate one molecule at a time. So I want to talk now about carriers and the fact that they can only accommodate one molecule at a time means that at some point they reach a point of saturation. So they have this substrate specificity, meaning only one molecule at a time is accommodated, and therefore they become saturated. Now that might make perfect sense to some of you. I recognize that probably our engineers, Ben and Sally, are like, totally solid, saturated, they've already visualized the curve, the function that describes that, and they're recognizing the asymptote as the function approaches um, saturation. Great, wonderful, more power to you. But if, in case you're not visualizing that, let me make a quick analogy. I like to say that channels are kind of like water passing through this colander that I have in my kitchen.
That is, notice that the water is really not particularly impeded by the passing through the colander. Very much like that, channels don't impede the movement, the downhill movement of, of molecules moving from a region of higher concentration to lower count concentration particularly much. They basically act like a sieve, and essentially there's a linear function that describes this. That is, the, the greater the concentration gradient, the faster the movement through the channel. Now, carriers on the flip side are much more like a ship passing through a lock. Now, this is a picture that I took when I was um, up in Minneapolis, and you can see that this is a ship that has come into this lock, and it has been lowered down to the lower uh, point, and I, I kind of sat there and watched as it, as it did so. And this is only able to accommodate one ship at a time. So if there's a whole bunch of sh other ships upstream at the same time, they're going to have to wait their turn to go through the lock. This is much more like a carrier. So a carrier combined to one substrate molecule at a time, it undergoes a conformational change, and then it lets that molecule out on the other side. So understanding then that, that if there are many ships waiting for this lock, they're going to just have to wait. They're just going to have to wait. Saturation, right? That's saturation. That means that there's this backlog of all of these ships like hanging out, you know, they're like, oh, I have to wait for this lock. This is saturation. So now we can understand drawing the function that is the um, either linear function for simple passive diffusion. And this is what channels tend to approach as well. I'm going to put that in parentheses they tend to approach linear too, so channels tend to approach linear, but for carriers, for carriers, carriers become saturated. Now, originally, as the, um, as the carrier is accommodating these molecules, it's much more rapid because it provides this wonderful route of influx, but then as there are more and more molecules, that is, as the concentration gradient gets higher and higher, we start to uh, re reach a plateau um, at which the function uh, approaches the maximum rate of transport. So saturation is reached. So hopefully that makes sense to a certain extent that carriers can become saturated because they can only accommodate one molecule at a time, but perhaps it will also help to look at a picture of this. This shows a carrier. Notice that this carrier specifically binds to the solute that it carries, that it is, has specificity and a specific binding site. Once that molecule binds to the carrier, the molecule literally triggers changes in conformation. So think of it as being kind of like dominoes, where once the molecule binds, we start to see one amino acid change, and then another amino acid changes, and then another, and another, and another, and finally it opens up a whole lining to that carrier that then accommodates and conformationally changes to allow the solute molecule to pass. So the solute molecule binds specifically to the outside, Conformational change takes place, and bada bing, it is entered into the cell. Now, the important thing to mention here is that if the concentration of this triangular solute molecule is greater outside the cell than inside the cell, then it's going to flux in through this carrier. But if suddenly the concentration of that triangle molecule gets greater inside the cell than outside the cell, it's going to flux right on back out because it's in response to its concentration gradient. That is, once again, this is a passive process. So what are things that a cell might be able to do to stop from losing a molecule maybe that it wants to keep inside, right? Maybe it doesn't want it to turn back around and go back out once it gets concentrated inside of the cell. Well, there's a couple strategies that it can use. One is it can actually modify this molecule as it's coming in and make it something different so it doesn't count against the concentration gradient. Um, the other thing it can do is once it brings it in, it can like compartmentalize it and put it away somewhere so that it doesn't count against that concentration gradient. So there's a couple different strategies that can be used there. So in order to maintain a concentration gradient that is amenable to transport, Many cells immediately transform the transported molecule into something else. Or if we're talking eukaryotic cell, they can stick it in an organelle. Why not pack it away in one of the organelles, whether that be a mitochondria, a chloroplast, 
or something of that nature. So they might pack that away, move it into another compartment. Now you might even argue that bacterial cells could do that as well, that maybe they could tuck it away into a storage granule of some sort and make it into a polymer that would not count against the gradient. So that's another strategy for maintaining uh, the, the, cell, the molecules in the cell. I want to give you just a couple of examples of carriers and channels, focusing on some channels. Uh, certain potassium uptake systems are actually carriers. We sometimes call those for short K-up. Um, and so these uh, bring in, or cup, <laughs> these bring in potassium ions. So this is one type of carrier. Uh, certain channels are very, very famous. Uh, for example, aquaporins. Uh, aquaporins are very famous because they transport water. And what's weird about that is that when I was sitting in your seats, when I was your age, and I was learning about transport systems, we were told that water moved by simple passive diffusion. We now understand that, in fact, there are um, facilitated diffusion transporters, channels for, for water. So these fit into a category called um, major intrinsic proteins. Uh, they include not only the aquaporins, but also the glycerol facilitators. And what's really cool is that some major intrinsic proteins, or MIPs, are both. That is, they are both glycerol facilitators and aquaporins. Um, so we call them aqua glycerol porins. And this is a really cool picture of an aqua glycerol porin. Hey, recognize that it's an all alpha helical structure. See all those alpha helixes there that um, do span the membrane? And then we recognize that it makes this nice polar haven for polar molecules to pass through the hydrophobic bilayer. In fact, if we were to draw the bilayer on here, in case you're having trouble picturing that, um, this is an integral membrane protein tucked into the phospholipid bilayer and spanning the phospholipid bilayer, and then providing a safe haven for those polar molecules, glycerol and water, to get into the cell. And this particular aquaglycerol porin is found in E. coli, but there are, um, we are, there are many mammalian aquaporins, um, I think actually a dozen, around a dozen, that have been identified for sure. Um, so we see these in other systems, not just within bacteria. E. coli, just one, one, one very good example. So it's interesting to note that facilitated diffusion is much more common in um, multicellular eukaryotes than it is in bacteria. And we might just think about why, like why it's less likely to see that in E. coli than it is to see it, for example, in a liver cell. If you think about it, um, our body, like our liver cells, well, we control what's outside of the liver. That is, our body tightly controls, say, blood glucose levels. So it's very easy for the liver to then use facilitated diffusion to bring in the glucose that it needs because we control the environment around it. We control the blood. But bacteria, they don't have any control of the environment around them. So, say, E. coli, it doesn't control how much glycerol or how much water is in the environment around it. So it's much less likely to use um, a facilitated diffusion transporter to try to concentrate glycerol. And that just makes a lot of sense. In the last few minutes of our podcast, let's turn our attention away from passive transport and active transport. That means this is the type of transport that does require energy. And the reason that it does is because it's concentrating something against its gradient. That is, despite the fact that the concentration of something is low outside the cell and high inside, the cell is pumping in energy to still bring in a molecule that it wants. So it's, it's concentrating it against its gradient. So active transport does, in fact, require energy. It requires energy in input, and that energy may take a couple of different forms. So we can think about what some of those forms are as we write down that active transport requires that input of energy. Now, transport systems might range. There are, is a group called the major facilitator superfamily. And perhaps you were thinking about what some of those energy sources might be. And maybe some of you thought about the PMF. The proton motive force makes a fantastic energy source for transport. And in fact, much like our Finding Nemo analogy, where the turtles were riding the EAC, um, the PMF makes a great river to, to ride to get into the, into the cell. So the major facilitator superfamily are those transporters that tap into the PMF 
to act as a source of energy. And the most common, or at least a common type of a major facilitator superfamily is when you have the PMF, that is the proton ion, going down its gradient, and then a molecule right in that PMF on into the cell. So the particular example that I want to talk about and show you is one called the lactose permease in E. coli, where essentially the proton ion, you're seeing it over here on the left, is going to bind to the external region of this transporter. This is going to trigger a conformational change in the transporter. And once that conformational change has taken place, the lactose can act like the kayak riding the PMF stream to get into the cell. So let's watch it happen. Boom, we've got the lactose ride in the PMF. <laughs> totally rad way to get a ride into the cell. So major facilitator superfamily transporters are the transporters that utilize the proton motive force as energy. And a symport is the most common type of that where in fact the, um, the concomitant influx of two substances is what we see. So that means at the same time as a proton ion comes in, the lactose molecule rides that proton ion into the cell. Antiports are the opposite. That is, a proton ion comes in and is exchanged for something else. So we can see the opposite direction of transport in an antiport. One molecule goes in, the other goes out, or one ion goes in, the other goes out. Um, it is the opposite direction. The good example that we have here is the sodium pump of E. coli that literally exchanges a proton for a sodium cation. It works out pretty slick, both of them a plus one charge, and they get exchanged. What's also neat about this is that sodium ion gradients can be established at the outside of an E. coli cell, and the sodium ion gradient can be like another route for transport in. That is, sodium ions can uh, power the, the transport in of certain amino acids and sugars. So antiport versus symport, same direction of two substances versus opposite direction. Here in both cases, these are major facilitator superfamily proteins because they are powering, um, they are using the PMF to power the, the influx or, or efflux of the um, other ion or molecule. Obviously, if the PMF serves as one possible source for en of energy, ATP can serve as the other. And we have a special kind of transport system named expressly for the fact that it uses ATP as its energy source. These, these particular transporters are called A, B, C transporters. We almost never refer to them by their ATP binding cassette full name. Um, so they're known by their nickname of A, B, C transporters. But they do use ATP hydrolysis as their means of energy um, for transport. So ATP gets broken down in order to power the influx of a molecule. Let's look at specifically how an ABC transporter works, noting that it is commonly used to um, bring in certain sugars, like arabinose is one good example, certain amino acids, such as my favorite um, histidine. Um, so we see that a lot of different amino acids and sugars can get transported this way. ABC transporters are really cool because they require both a protein that's outside of the cell and the integral membrane protein that is like the red carpet to get into the cell. So notice that we might think of the, the um, protein outside of the cell as being sort of like the taxi cab that goes and picks up the sugar, for example, um, and brings it to the transporter. So let's watch that happen as boom, the transporter, the taxi cab goes and picks up the sugar and then it delivers it to the transporter and it'll take it in this transporter. But I want you to also watch that as that transport is, is happening, ATP is getting hydrolyzed in here to power that transport. Bada bing, bada boom, there we go. So transport with the concomitant hydrolysis of ATP uh, to ADP. So that literally means that a high energy phosphate group is lost, that it's a, a bond is broken, that a high energy um, bond is, is releasing the energy needed to bring in that molecule.
ABC transporters are very famous. They're found, they're ubiquitous. They're found in every domain of life. In fact, in humans, if we lack a certain ABC transporter in our lungs, then we have cystic fibrosis. So the disease cystic fibrosis comes from lacking one particular ABC transporter. Um, also, another interesting thing to note about ABC transporters is that in multi-drug resistant bacteria, ABC transporters have actually literally been turned backwards. They work to pump out um, the drugs that should be affecting those bacteria and allow those bacteria to express resistance to those drugs. Likewise, cancer cells have found ways to use ABC transporters to pump chemotherapeutic agents out of the cell. Pretty smooth criminals. So that being said, we're going to end there for today. I hope you all have an incredible weekend. Party hardy. Um, and I hope to hear from you soon about what you would like for your celebration for that incredibly, incredibly amazing exam.